He knows my name. Amen. Hallelujah. God has not forgotten. He knows your name and my name. And he calls us by our names. Hush. Hush. Somebody's calling your name. It must be Jesus calling my name. He knows us by our name and to God we give the glory as we thank God that he knows us individually and to the Reverend Dr. Linda Northlet and Reverend Valerie MacGyver leading us in worship other clergy persons who are present our Duke Divinity intern Brother Horatio Hartz to clergy persons, families, and my wife, Gwendolyn, to our stewards, our stewardesses, trustees, missionaries, young people, our sons of Allen, class leaders, ushers, our technicians, musicians, our young voices of praise. Amen. Give God some praise. For these young people and also for our young people who have been serving as ushers. Amen. Give God praise for those who are serving as ushers and all of our young people who serve in the life and the ministry of the church. And thank you to the parents who encourage your youth to be a part of the life and ministry of the church. And we give God the praise and the glory. And on today, as we are in the season of early voting, and it is my hope that everyone in here is a registered voter and you plan on voting between now and the 6th of November. And if you are not registered, you can do registration and voting during the early voting. So we want you to make sure that you exercise the privilege and the right 
that you have to vote. And then keeping our minds centered on as we go to the polls and vote, as God speaks to us about what God desires for those who represent us as elected officials. I want to return to the scripture lesson that has been read, which is Isaiah, the 32nd chapter, verses 1 through 8. Isaiah 32, 1 through 8. As I read from the English Standard Version, and you read along from your particular translation, let us listen together for the word of God. Behold, a king will reign in righteousness, and princes will rule in justice. Each will take, each will be like a hiding place from the wind, a shelter from the storm, like streams of water in dry places, like the shade of a great rock in a weary land. Then the eyes of those who see will not be closed, and the ears of those who hear will give attention. The heart of the hasty will understand and know, and the tongue of the stammers will hasten to speak distinctly. The fool will no more be called noble, nor the scoundrel said to be honorable. For the fool speaks folly, and his heart is busy with iniquity to practice ungodliness, to utter error concerning the Lord, to leave the craving of the hungry unsatisfied and to deprive the thirsty of drink. As for the scoundrel, his devices are evil he plans wicked schemes to ruin the poor with lying words, even when the plea of the needy is right. But he who is noble plans things, and on noble things he stands. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. And as I share from this particular passage of scripture today, and as you are planning to cast your vote in this election, I want you to think on this particular thought. Elect your future. Elect your future because the future of this state, the future of our nation, the future of our judiciary system rests in your vote. And your vote counts. And it's important that when you cast your vote, you are seeking God's guidance on the persons that he desires to represent the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Those persons who represent the people in who 
elect them. And so today, I want to invite you to listen as I share with you from Isaiah. As Isaiah was concerned about the future of Judah. He was concerned that there had been so many corrupt leaders. And he had spoken against them in chapters 30 and 31. But now in 32, he begins to offer some hope for the future of Judah. The future of right or wrong. The future of good and evil. The future of the oppressed and liberty. The future of morality and immorality. The future of justice for the poor and exploitation by the rich. The future rests in the hands of the voters who go to the polls between now and November the 6th that we might elect persons who will represent the people in a way that's pleasing unto God. Isaiah is expressing his unchanging conviction that the nature of the circumstances of society depends on the character of the people. In particular, the leaders. The philosopher George Smith says, leaders are not the whole of life. But they are conditions of all the rest. Because the leaders that we put in office represent us when it comes to voting in the Senate, voting in the city, the county, representing us on the bench as judges in making decisions on behalf of each one of us. Decisions that impact our families. Whether we have the Christian liberties that we so long desire here in this nation impact our children's education whether there will be funds available for teachers and and whether teachers will get a decent salary and as they educate our children and, and as our children continue to strive for excellence in education and, and, and making sure that any child that wants to go to college will be able to go to college because if they get an education then they will get a good paying job and then the good paying job the government will get their money back from those children now paying taxes if they would look at it that way and and make sure that no child has to worry about financing his or her education and and understanding that if you would step in and, and, and make sure the institutions of higher education are available financially for everybody you'll get your money back but if they can't get a higher education for a higher income then many of them the government will take care of them the rest of their lives so that's why it's important that we listen out for those who will make sure that funds are poured in 
to the education system of our children. Making sure that there are no cuts in health care and making sure that no matter what a person's health condition is, they will not be denied health insurance. That we will know that we have the opportunities that are rightly ours as human beings in the United States of America that if we get sick, then we can be cared for. Your vote counts. But the only way you know who to vote for is you study the record of the person. You've seen politics paid out enough to where people vote based on their political party and don't take time to look at each individual candidate and see if they really stand for the values that you hold true to. God is calling on us to vote our values. Isaiah sees a reformed society. The source of the change is the character of the ruling party. And those who are in political office. When righteous and justice is their character, society feels their purifying influence to where they will stand for righteousness and justice for all people. No matter what their race, their creed, or their color. The rulers are not tyrants when they are righteous and and, and justice. They become friends and protectors of all people. The people are moral. And confidence is restored. Artificial class distinctions disappear. And true character reigns when the people are righteous and just and they elect righteous and just leaders. And if you can't find somebody that's righteous and just next time because you are righteous and just run for a political office so that you might represent those who are looking for someone who's righteous and just. Persons who no longer question the wealth and poverty, but make sure that there is an equal playing field. And those who are the privileged making sure that they are sharing their privileges. And some of us might be in here in privileged positions and, and you see in your privileged position that there are some people who are left out. And God is calling on you and I to be righteous and just and, and if there's any way that we can in our own positions of privilege help somebody who is being left out. I've chaired board of examiners and I know that the AME church 
does not do right by female preachers because it's still a male hierarchy. And I've been intentional in everywhere I've served to make sure that female ministers have an opportunity to serve in leadership positions. Because there is a place where I have a privilege of authority. And I have to use that privilege of authority to break down a system. I have privilege and authority been appointed in over finance committees and I have to take that privilege of authority and and make sure that there is accountability, check and balance. And many times when you use your privilege to bring about accountability, those who still want to hold that power of privilege will try to squash you, but truth crushed to the ground will rise again. And God is calling on his people to do justice, seek mercy, and walk humbly with their God. Because God is a God of justice and righteousness. Justice is God-given heavenly rewards of good and even out of his justice he holds back his wrath of total destruction so that his people might come to him and and repent and return to him. And he is righteous. The definition by the theologian Thayer says that the state of him who is such as he ought to be In the wide sense, it refers to that which is upright or virtuous, displaying integrity, purifying life, and correctness in feeling and action. This is what we are called to do righteous. To have integrity. Let our word be our bond. Let our yes be yeses and our no's be no's. And and not be tossed and driven by every sound and wind. And not just go along to get along. But stand for holiness. Stand for righteousness. And stand for justice. Even if it means that you will be ostracized. Because one thing that you can know. That if God is for you. It doesn't matter if the whole world is against you. Because if you're standing for righteousness. God will take care of you. So the first thing that the writer helps us to understand is the center of righteousness and justice is God, God's self. Because God is holy. And holy is God's essence. And righteousness is a mode of his holiness. A way by which he expresses toward him expresses himself toward his creation. He is what holiness and righteousness must be. And, and, and God being the God of 
holiness. He, he created us in his image, which is holy and righteousness. And, and God's desire that we might be in relationship with him through a holy and righteous relationship, showing justice and mercy to all humanity. It is clear from what the writer said about righteousness has to do with the fulfillment of the demands of relationships. Whether the relationship is with each other or with God. It's clear that we fail in relationships. We fail in our relationship with God. And we fail in our relationship with one another. And God created us for relationships. To first be in relationship with God. And when we have an intimate relationship with God, meaning that we get to know God who already knows all about us and we know what God's will is and, and we know what God's desires is for our lives and know that we desire that we have a hope and a future when we embrace that and, and decide that we're going to do God's will and, and study his word so that we will day by day know more and more about him when we declare that this is the life that we're going to live we find ourselves in a growing relationship with God And when we are growing in relationship with God, we better know how to be in relationship with each other. Because it's our relationship with God that teaches us how to love each other. Teaches us how to be gentle toward each other. Teaches us how to be kind to one each other. Teaches us how to love unconditionally toward each other. Teaches us how to get along with each other. Teaches us how to reconcile with each other. Teaches us how to forgive each other. Teaches us how that we are to be there for one another. When we're in relationship with God, we know better how to be in relationship with each other. That's why when I'm doing premarital sessions, I tell couples, your number one relationship is with God. Because when you are in a relationship with God, then God will show you how to be in relationship with your mate. Because Outside of an intimate relationship with God, we don't know how to love in any any other way other than selfishness. But when we fall in love with God and, and God teaches us how to love unconditionally, then we learn that love is not a feeling. Love is a decision that says, I'm going to love you in spite of what you've said, in spite of what you did. I'm going to forgive you and I'm going to keep on loving you because I'm going to love you to the point that love will cover the multitude of sins. But that kind of love only comes with an intimate relationship with God. Because God is love. And God teaches us that everybody has relationships. And when we are in relationships of authority, we have a responsibility not only to the people, but we have a responsibility to God. Kings have responsibility to the people. Judges with the complainant. Clergy with the members. The common person with family. The elected officials with the community. The community with the residents and the aliens and the poor. And all a part of 
being in relationship with God and one another. And that's why the greatest commandment of all is that we are to love God with our heart, our soul, and our mind, and our neighbor as ourselves. When we get this right, then we don't have to worry about anything else because we will be acting out of righteousness and justice that comes through God. Having these relationships, the judge in Israel, righteousness is more than the fulfillment of the demands of the community, but it's a balance for harmony. The judge wishes to restore the righteousness of the community. Righteous judgments are protective and restoring. When judges sit on the bench and magistrates serve they and the DAs, they are serving the people and they are doing everything they can do to make sure the communities are whole and healthy and restore those areas that are weak. And when the righteous king comes, people's motives will become transparent. And this righteous king is Christ. For you and I, we know that Isaiah might have been talking about the kingship coming of Hezekiah, but Hezekiah himself was influenced by the Egyptians and at one time was a follower of God, but he became corrupt. But when we look into Isaiah's future, in our past, we see the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus the Christ, He who is our ruler. And when we surrender our lives to Him and we say, I confess you with my mouth that you are Lord, it means that. I submit my authority to yours. I recognize you as Lord of my life. And I no longer seek my will. But it's your will that I want to be done in my life. With his perfections, he offered us a perfect humanity. He died in a man's stead. And whatever was accomplished satisfied the infinite demand of holiness of God that a people who were created in the image and likeness of God who fell from that image of holiness and righteousness. God saw that he had only one choice. And that was to send his righteous son who took the place of you and me and offered himself once and for all for the sins of the whole world. And when King Jesus reigns in our hearts, there is no place for sin. For when he reigns in our hearts, it doesn't mean that we won't sin. It just means that it won't remain in our hearts because we will be convicted by the Holy Spirit and we will immediately cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me from my unrighteousness. Create in me, God, a clean and a pure heart that I might walk upright before you, that I might be restored back to a right relationship with you. And when we are restored to that relationship, then we are sanctified, sanctified in his word because his word is truth 
and through the sanctification we become mature in the faith and we begin to live a life of righteousness not because of any good in us but because we are connected to the righteous one Jesus who said that I'm going to send back to you a comforter who would teach you all things that I've commanded of you this is the work of the Holy Spirit who is in our lives and when he is in our lives we only seek those who would represent us as men and women who display holiness and righteousness because our faith looks up to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world. So in closing, the Bible says whatever you are thinking about, whoever you are considering to elect, seek first the kingdom of heaven and all its righteousness. God will place on you those heavenly values, that heavenly wisdom that you ought to look for in the lives of those you plan to elect. And when you do it, you elect those who stand for holiness, who stand for righteousness. And you know that Jesus is our king. As Isaiah said, that he will be a rock in a weary land, shelter in a time of storm, water to the thirsty, food to the hungry. He will satisfy your soul's hunger and thirst for righteousness and justice and you will walk in his way in his will and we will elect those who will walk in righteousness and justice and we will look up to them and we will see our nation turning around for good representing the kingdom of heaven here on earth is there anybody that believes what I believe? That justice, justice, justice will stand. Righteousness will reign. We'll see it in our day. The land coming back to holy righteousness because we are the righteous ones who will not sit down or become complacent, but we will fold and stand for righteousness, stand for justice, stand for the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Is there anybody that's gonna join God? Say it. As we stand throughout the church, and we extend to you the invitation of Christian discipleship. And if there's someone here today and you want to experience this right relationship that comes by accepting the righteous one Jesus the only way we can declare we're righteous is he's our Lord and Savior 
by receiving him, then you can declare that I'm righteous. Because none but the righteous shall see God. And I want to make sure that when your soul takes flight from this body, when it can no longer maintain life here on this earth, when your soul returns to the Father, you hear it say, well done, and not depart from me, because it's only the righteous to hear him, we'll hear him say, well done. And righteous has nothing to do with you being perfect. Nothing at all. Righteous has everything to do with you by faith. Accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if you're here right now, and you want to make sure that on this day, you can declare that you are among the righteous. All you have to simply do is accept Christ as your Lord and Savior by faith. So will you come right now and accept him? And maybe you're here and you've never been baptized and you want to come and offer yourself as a candidate of baptism. We invite you to come. And if you don't have a church home, we invite you to come and join St. Joseph. Is there one that will come and join the church? Is there one who will come and offer yourself as a candidate of baptism? Is there one that will come and receive the righteous Christ? So that you can know with assurance that you're among the righteous that will see God. If you don't have that assurance, Come right now, let us pray together. The prayer of salvation. If no responses, it's prayer time. You may come to the altar and pray. And if we have guests who've come in during this time, remember, just come to the altar and they kneel. And after they have said their prayer, they return to their seats leaving space for others to come. And as you come to the altar, if there's anyone who desires for one of the clergy to kneel with you in prayer, just wave your hand in front of you. And we will kneel with you in prayer. And what do you say when your friends turn away and you're all alone, all alone Tell me what do you give, yeah You're giving your all, yeah And it seems like you can't make it through Well, you just stand When there's nothing left to do You just stand Watch the Lord see you through Yes, after you've done all you can You just stand Tell me how do we handle The guilt of your past, yes Tell me how do you deal with the strain And how can you smile When your heart has been broken And filled with pain Filled with pain Tell me what do you give Ooh, When you've given your own and it seems like you can't make it, can't make it.
make it through Child, you just stand When there's nothing left to do You just stand Watch the Lord see you through Just after you've done all you can You just stand And endure Be not entangled In the bondage of you You just stand, yeah And endure God has a purpose Yes, God has And it seems like you can't make it through, oh Lord. Oh, you just stand. When you've done all you can, you just stand. Oh, you just stand. Oh Lord, you stand through the hurt. Stand through the pain. Stand through the sunshine, stand through the rain, after you've done all you can, after you've done all you can, after you've gone through the hurt, yeah. After you've gone through the pain, oh Lord. After you've gone through the ridicule, oh, after you've gone through the heartbreak, Oh, on your knees you prayed, you prayed and you cried. You prayed and you cried, yeah. Oh, you prayed and you cried. You prayed and you cried, oh. Oh, after you've done all you can. Oh, after you've done all you can. You all you can. Oh, after you've done all you can. Mm, after you've done all you can. Oh, after you've given it all that you could. After you felt like you've had it all, all up to your shoulders, yeah.